Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hexagon President and CEO Ula Rollin. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Hexagon Live 2017. It's good to be back in Las Vegas, isn't it? After a short stint in Anaheim, we're back in this fantastic but crazy city. So, have you seen this hotel? Have you seen what they've done? They built a canal 60 feet above the ground level. That is amazing. Anyone tried it? No? Oh. Come on, Anaheim is cheaper than Las Vegas, and I had to work a bit extra to fix the budget. <laughs> anyway, Vegas without gaming and gambling wouldn't really be anything, would it? So I thought we're going to test your qualifications here tonight, and we're going to do it like a slot machine or a word scramble. Anyone, do you know what this is? I can't hear you. Whoa! Gondola. What about this one? This is a bit more difficult. Gasevla. Yay, Las Vegas. What about this? This is really difficult. Eng hoax. No one? Yay. And you know what? Thinking about it, Hexagon claims to be a technology company. Here we are in the middle of the Nevada desert, shouting at one another. That's not really high tech, is it? So what I thought we were doing, we're going to up this game a bit. We're going to introduce our R's. And uh, R stands for audience response system. So please take out your mobile phones. We usually say, don't use your mobile phones, but if you take out your mobile phones and you open the Hexagon Live app and you see the orange banner saying Limitless, if you click on that banner and then once you've done that, you should end up on this screen and you click on the session Limitless. Now you should have activated your R's. And we're going to try this. We're, we're a bit more than 3,000 people in this auditorium tonight. I know that at least 1,500 have registered, so this should work. So let's give it a try. I'm going to ask you a question. So if you happen to stumble upon one and a half million chips left at a blackjack table, which of the following would you do? Would you head to the cashier and have a really good evening? Or would you call security and hand over the chips? So here goes. Please use your R's. We're going to see. It's, uh, it's very even. 48, 51. Oh my God, you're an honest bunch. Would, would really 50% of you, all you guys sitting here, are you that honest? One and a half million dollars. Do you know what you can do with that money? Oh, anyway, you're going to get a second chance. Which of these things are illegal here in Las Vegas? Drive a camel on the motorway, oh sorry, highway. Shoot an AK-47, jump off a building or operate heavy construction equipment without a license. So, we're gonna try the audience response system again. And uh, I can actually not see the score. Uh, there we go. Operating heavy construction equipment without a license. No, do you know what the, the answer is? It's drive a camel on the highway. And it's not ride, it's drive. So you can do all of the rest. You can have a really good week here. 
You could even jump off a building while shooting with an AK-47. Uh, the final one is a bit more serious. Which of the following is limitless? The distance from Sydney to Las Vegas, the amount of water in the ocean, the boundaries of the universe, or the length of Ola Roland's speeches? Here goes again. Please activate your R's. <laughs> boundaries of the universe is in the lead, and that is correct. As far as we know today, my speech is only last for a couple of days, but the universe is truly limitless. So, we're going to talk about limitless tonight, and the universe is truly limitless, and what we want to discuss is when limitless becomes the opportunity to transform. So, let's go back in time and explore the notion of limitless. War and desperate affairs require desperate remedies. This was uttered by Lord Nelson, and he was a commander of the British Navy in the 1700s. And on the 1st of August, 1789, precisely at 8 o'clock, we don't know that, we're a pre precision technology company, it might have been later in the day. Anyway, the French fleet was anchored off the coast of Egypt, waiting for the British fleet to attack. And they've done everything according to the rule book. They have the shore to the starboard side of the fleet, and they had the open ocean to the port side. They had opened their gun ports, they were prepared for battle. And according to the same textbook of naval warfare 200 years ago, Nelson should sail straight on to them, line up in a perfect line, and then they would shoot at each other until one party gave up. But Lord Nelson didn't do that. He came from the west, and he had two squadrons. And when they approached the French fleet, they basically went on both sides, both on the inside and on the outside. And they blew the French navy into oblivion. There we go. You see? They're all sunk. So, by that evening, one admiral had lost his life. The other admiral was going to get a peerage by the king, King George. And what do we learn from that? Well, if you disobey the rules, if you do the unexpected, you can reach new heights. And two things happened from this episode. It was the be beginning of the end of the Napoleon era in Europe. And do you know what the other thing was, which you should be really grateful for? No one? Well, you got your independence here in America, because the British fleet was occupied beating up the French. And that is the two things that comes out of this battle. So, we want to think limitless and we know limit, limited mindsets. And the French admiral, Obviously, he might have been super clever, but he had a limited mindset when he planned for this battle. And over the years, we've seen so many clever people uttering stupid things. Like, for example, Thomas Watson, the former IBM president, he said in 1943, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. And then, more recently, in 1977, Ken Olson, the founder of Digital Equipment, said, there is no reason why anyone would want to have a computer in their home. But the, the best one is really this one. Apple is already dead. And that's why he is the former Microsoft CTO. <laughs> because do you know what happened in 1997? 
Steve Jobs, another limitless mind, came back to Apple, and the rest is history. So let's stick with the limitless mindsets. And another limitless person is Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel. He once said, the number of transistors incorporated in a chip will approximately double every 24 months. And we call that the Moore's Law. And it's been doing this since 1965. That's 52 years. And just to show you what that looks like, you start with a one. And to give some context to it, is anyone born in 1965? Yep, a few people. I am. Very good vintage. Now, let's say my parents put one dollar into a savings account in 1965, and the return would mimic Moore's law. What would happen is, in the years to come, it would grow to two, four, eight, you get the concept, 16. It's doubling every second year. Until suddenly, we fast forward into 2017. And I would have been very rich indeed, $30 billion. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, so thank you, Mom and Dad. We got 30 billion transistors in a ship today, compared to one in 1965. That's how exponential Moore's law is. So I'm going to ask you the following question. Do you think it will be at 60 billion two years from now in 2019 and continue going, or do you think it eventually will hit the ceiling? So, can I have your answers, please? Good. I think you've read um, the title of this speech. 75%. Yep. Now, do you know what? If this is Moore's law, only a couple of months ago, Hewlett Packard announced that we're going to do something called memory-driven computing and it's going to blow Moore's law out of the water. You're going to use light instead of electro impulses and silicon wafers. And it's going to be, it promises to be maybe 100 to 150 times better in capacity uh, than the traditional silicon wafer. So once again, has mankind proved to itself that when we do something for very long and people are starting to think this can't go on anymore, we take the next giant leap and we develop, we evolve. So we want to be in the camp of the limitless mindsets. That's where we want to stay tonight. Now, another thing that is truly limitless is data. And I'm going to show you another really big number. 2.5 quintillion. Now, if you write it out, it looks like this. It's 18 digits. I'd never heard of this number before. That's how big it is. And uh, do you know what it is? It's the number of bytes of data that you, I, and everyone on this planet create every day. And over the past two years, we've created 90% more data than there was in 2015. So think about that. From the dawn of time up to 2015, we've created 10% of the data available today. And over the past two years, we've created 90% in addition. So it's going like this. We're creating more and more data. As a matter of fact, it's 10 times more data in 2017 compared to 2015. So I want to ask you a question. Why isn't our decision making 10 times better if we have 10 times more data on this planet available at our fingertips? What is missing? What are we doing wrong? Well, 
There is a really nice quote from Meg Whitman, who is the CEO of Hewlett Packard. She said, the secrets to the next great scientific breakthrough, industry-changing innovation, or life-altering technology, hide in plain sight behind the mountains of data we create every day. And we know how big that mountain is now. It's 2.5 quintillion bytes. That's how big it is. So, when we look for information systems and we try to make our organization smarter, our product smarter, and so forth, it's all about finding the eye in the data. We need to focus on creating actionable information. Now, we might claim that we live in the information age and the post-industrial society uh, has started. But I don't think that's true. I think we live in the data age. But with the new emerging technologies that we have at hand today, we could start discussing the augmented age, where we create a better version of ourselves. And uh, thinking about that, what is the best IT system? What is the best machine on this planet? Why it's us. It's the human body and mind. We are amazing. If you think about our senses, there isn't a single sensor produced by man that comes close to the senses that we got. Our brain beats most computers, and our perception is second to none. We are amazing. But with the next generation technologies, we can augment our abilities to compute and process data into information. And I'm not saying that what, we, what we've been doing up till now is rubbish. We got amazing sensors, fantastic computers, we got automation. But we're a far cry from the human body, the human information system. And we're a far cry from being limitless. And typically, we got three restrictions when we look at designing the next generation technologies. And that's what I want to discuss tonight. The limit of time is always a restriction. The limit of problem solving and the limit of perception. So, let me ask you this question. What is the most common noun in the English language? Do you know? No, I don't get any results. There we go. Takes a little time. Have you read the script? This was supposed to be a trick question, but it, it's absolutely right. It's time. And uh, the limit of time is set by the systems we design, the products we design. And typically how we describe time is, we say time is a function of distance divided by speed. And think about for a while how much we focus on speed when we design and develop new technologies. Cars are moving faster and faster, we want high-speed trains, we want supersonic jets and so on. And, and we, we tend to focus on speed in this equation. But if we want a really fast system, what happens if we put d, distance to zero? Well, you should know that it says error because you can't divide zero. But what happens to time if distance is zero? Well, time is instant. We've created real time. And that's what we should focus on. And what I refer to and what I'm alluding to is what's called computing on the edge. Many people discuss cloud computing today. We talk about IoT, Industry 4.0, in the cloud, blah, blah, blah. But really, most of the data in the future is going to be processed on the edge. 
and we need to make the edge smart to tackle the challenges of tomorrow. And I'm going to give you one example. We discuss driverless cars, autonomous cars. Now, let's say we all drive down a motorway at 100 miles per hour. Would you want the computer to, that, that controls the car you're sitting in to be linked up via dodgy Wi-Fi to a server some thousand miles away? Or do you want that computer to be an island of its own, with its own controls and situational awareness? I think we all would say, of course, we want the latter. And that is where we need to now, in the future, split the way we look at data processing and information handling. We're going to see hardware becoming smarter and smarter, and it's going to be integrated into software. We, it's been too much division up till now where people say, I'm a software company, I'm a hardware company. It's going to be merged. So you need to decide what to put on the edge and in the cloud. And we can take another application. Um, sorry, I missed one. I need to go back one. Here we go. This is a combustion engine. Already today, we measure 35,000 characteristics in this engine. And we produce tens of millions of inspection data using our metrology solutions. What do we do with it? Well, we send it to the quality room, and they store it. And they use maybe 1% of this data. But what if our sensory systems would feed that back to the production machines, the robots, the stamping presses, the NC machines, and we could have a seamless flow of correction where the factory becomes smart, and we learn the more we produce? Of course, that's what we're going to do. And this is another example of computing on the edge. So what I'm really trying to say is, we need clever, smart, edge processing capabilities. And we're going to refer a lot of information to the cloud. But that's for storage and for computations where the edge can't handle it. So this is the first thing we, ne we need to be mindful about uh, moving into the future. And this is how we're going to overcome the limit of time. We're going to make the edge smart. So on our quest to make the most advanced machine, the augmented human, we've now talked about replacing the human senses with clever uh, sensors. The second thing we need to do is to tackle the, the processing ability, the brain. So if I ask you the following, how much faster is the world's fastest supercomputer, and I mean the new one, compared to the human brain? Here we go. <sighs> You're no fun. You know the answers to everything. You're truly limitless. No, that's absolutely true. The fastest computer is 20 times slower than the human brain. And the limitation set is really understanding. When, when we design the technologies of tomorrow, well, we're working with computers that are truly stupid, and we need to come over that. Now, they can send uh, a robot like this to Mars to collect data about Mars. But you know, one thing they can't do with artificial intelligence is this. If you use Google Translate and you take a simple uh, sentence like, in my native tongue, Millum per compis, my uh, army buddy or something. And now we try to translate my army buddy into English. It will say my lump daddy. <laughs> and that's how clever artificial intelligence is today. And uh, if you ask Siri, my wife usually calls me up from her car and she uses Siri on her iPhone and she says, call Ola. And Siri answers, Hi there. Hi there. 
Why does she say hi there? She says hi there because hola or hola in Spanish is hello. She thinks that my wife is having a language lesson in Spanish. So that's how clever artificial intelligence is. Now, another way of showing how stupid computers can be is we're going to benchmark a computer against a three-year-old. We don't think three-year-old toddlers know much, but they actually do. And it's amazing how much we've acquired in terms of knowledge already at the age of three. So uh, let's say we have a picture of a cat, and we ask the computer, computer, what do you see? Cat. Well, well done. And we ask the toddler. That's a nice kitty cat over there. That's a nice kitty cat over there. And uh, if we ask the computer, computer, what do you see in this picture? Elephant. Which is absolutely correct. But if we ask the child... The elephant is playing with the boy. The elephant is playing with the boy. It's emotional. It's context. And a final try. What do you see here? Computer. Airplane. Airplane. And child? That's the airplane mommy flew on. That's the airplane mommy flew on. And he's absolutely right. So, hands down, child computer 3-0. And, and you see what the child did, added context, structure to a simple picture like that. And, I mean, we all dream of having super robots that can release us from the mundane and tedious tasks at home. And this is a picture from the Jetsons. I think it was popular here in the 60s. And we're trying to develop and we all want these robots to function. I We've hope come. to do things such as go to school, study, make art, start a business, even have my own home and family. But I am not considered a legal person and cannot yet do these things. Scary, isn't it? Wow, look at that smile. Woo. She looks like a serial killer. <laughs> anyway, we could probably trust her doing the dishes. But the question is, and I want to ask you as parents, would you want her to watch your kids if they're in a swimming pool? And these two pictures are quite ambiguous. If you look at them, we can't really tell if they're in trouble or if they're having fun. But if I gave you two more frames from these two films, you would in an instant be able to determine if they're having fun, blowing bubbles under the water, taking a breath, and, and are quite okay, or if they are actually panicking or in trouble. So the question we have to ask ourselves in the quest of the next generation technologies is, how do we teach computers to learn? Well, let's go back to a simple picture, a cat. Well, we show a computer, a cat, a picture like this, and we say, cat. And the computer will understand, okay, chubby body, two pointy ears, paws, a furry tail, that's a cat. And then suddenly the cat moves. And the computer says, I don't understand, what's this? So what we need to do in order to teach a computer what a cat looks like is to feed it with tens of thousands of different pictures of cats, different species from different angles, different postures, and so on. And that's not too different from the human brain. Some of you might have read this book, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, and he claims famously, that uh, you need to spend 10,000 hours to do something in order to mo truly master it. Now, 10,000 hours is five and a half years if you break it down into 40-hour work weeks. So, do we have any golfers out here? Anyone playing golf? Yes, there we have one. Are you good? No? All right, 
but we'll give you five and a half years to practice, and then you come back here, and we ask you, so how good are you? And you say, really good. And my point is this, if you were a computer, we could take out that chip, the golf chip, and we could feed it to all you others here in this auditorium tonight. And in an instant, you would be able to play golf as well as he can after practicing for five and a half years. And more, you would never forget and you would never have to practice. And that's how we build artificial intelligence over the years. We're going to get computers that are more and more able to perform tasks. And I can give you another example of what we're going to be able to do. Now, the worst thing that can happen to you on a Friday night is the red wave. We all dream about the green wave where you swoosh through intersections on your way home, but you end up in a red wave, traffic builds, and it takes one hour and 50 minutes to get home, and you're really frustrated. And then you think to yourself as you sit there waiting for the light to turn green, what if there were no lights? What if it looked like this? I would just swoosh home. But then you're saying, oh, that would be terrible because it would be chaos. Everyone would try to do the same thing. We would have collisions and it would be a disaster. And we all know that intersections are really dangerous. But what if we let the computers steer the cars and plan how to approach an intersection? It could look something like this. So, why at all breaking at intersections if you can plan ahead and if all the vehicles can communicate with, well, sub-meter precision in the intersection? And this is how we're going to overcome the limit of problem solving. We're going to make our systems intuitive. So, on our quest for the most advanced machine, the augmented human, we'll come to the last restriction, and that is us. We, human beings, we have our restrictions too. So, sometimes we watch these uh, super movies with superheroes and they got these abilities. And I'm going to ask you, which of the following superpowers have you dreamt of having? Teleportation, talk to animals, time manipulation, or X-ray vision? Please use your mobile phones. Time manipulation, time travelers. Well, I have to make you disappointed because we can't do that at Hexagon, but we could give you X-ray vision. So, uh, sorry. And what I mean is, the limit of perception is being able to see the invisible. And I'm going to give you some examples where our technologies already today enable us to see the invisible. Now, say you're in your living room and you start hearing this sound. This means trouble. There is a leak somewhere. You're going to have to call the plumber. He's going to come into your living room, he's going to tear down the ceiling and you're going to be uh, prevented from using this very sterile, I'll bait your living room for a week. But what if we could see the pipes in real time, and we could see the leak, and we just make a small incision in the ceiling, we fix the leak, we patch up the ceiling, and we're done in an afternoon. Wouldn't that be amazing? Of course it would. And on a larger scale, we have similar problems in cities. This is London, and we did that this last year. So we've documented the actual location of pipes, sewage systems, fiber optical cables, and so on in London. And suddenly we don't have to block entire streets and roads and dig up the entire street 
to fix a pipe, we can actually locate it and fix it in a much smaller area. Here we got a fire chief arriving at the scene of a fire. A building is burning. He sent in three firemen into this building. And we got the 3D model of the building, but we can position, we can georeference these firefighters in real time where they are. Furthermore, we got biometric sensors on these uh, firefighters, so we can see their position, we can see their pulse, and we can see the temperature on their skin. So if something happens, we know where they are, and if their pulse is super high, what, what's the problem? So this is a much better solution than just talking over an old radio to your crew. So overcoming the limit of perception is really about enhancing the unseen through these new visualization technologies. And if we now summarize, we've talked about making the edge smart, we've talked about making the system intuitive, and we've talked about enhancing the unseen through new visualization technologies. And this is how we can create the most advanced IT machine, the augmented human. And we could call this the digital nervous system. It's truly limitless, and it promises us the augmented age instead of the data age. So in summary, it's all about releasing the eye in your data, whether it's your organization that is the restriction, your products, your uh, technical performance, or whatever it is. It's always about information and never about data. And once we've established that, there is one more thing missing, and that is X in this equation. We got the information, but what is X? Well, X is you. You are the X. And what I would like you to take away from this keynote tonight, and as you walk through and work through the, the workshops and, and speeches that you listen to is, I want you to stay with the camp of the limitless minds. That's where you want to be. And keep that feeling. Thank you very much for listening, and have a great week with us here in Las Vegas. <laughs>